Did you know there is a method that can unlock both the atomic bomb and the poker? In 1946, Stanislaw Ulam, working on the atomic bomb project at the Los Alamos National Laboratory as a mathematical physicist, found himself recovering from surgery. One day, while playing a solitaire game, he wondered if there was a way to calculate the probability of winning without playing endless games. Analytical methods seemed inadequate for such a task, and this sparked a novel idea. What if probabilities could be estimated by simulating the process repeatedly and observing the outcomes? Intrigued by this thought, Ulam shared his idea with his colleague John von Neumann, a pioneering mathematician and physicist also involved in the Manhattan Project. Von Neumann immediately recognized the potential of using random sampling techniques to tackle intricate mathematical problems, particularly those related to nuclear physics, where traditional methods often failed. Together, they began to formalize the approach, leveraging the emerging power of digital computers at Los Alamos to perform large-scale simulations. They named their approach the Monte Carlo method, after the famous casino in Monaco, symbolizing the reliance on randomness similar to games of chance. The Monte Carlo method has not only revolutionized physics, but also reshaped modern technology. Without it, we might never have unlocked the secrets of nuclear energy or built some of the AI models we rely on today. Now let's ask a fundamental question. How can randomness, something so unpredictable, be systematically used to accurately solve complex problems like understanding nuclear chain reactions or training advanced AI models? The puzzling part is that randomness feels chaotic and unpredictable. Yet, the Monte Carlo method uses it to produce precise and reliable results. Imagine trying to estimate the percentage of red jelly beans in a big jar without counting every single one. You could grab a handful of jelly beans, count how many are red, and calculate the percentage of red jelly beans in your hand. But, since your hand is only a small sample of the whole jar, that single percentage might not be very accurate. To get a better estimate, you could repeat this process several times. Grab a handful, calculate the percentage of red jelly beans, and write it down. Do this maybe 10 times. Now you have a bunch of percentages. If you add all those percentages together and divide by the number of handfuls you took, you'll get an average percentage. This average would be a fair estimate of the true percentage of red jelly beans in the jar. But how can we use this method to build an algorithm that can play a board game? What are the downsides of this method? What are the more advanced versions like Markov Chain Monte Carlo? How are these related to advanced image generators of DAL-E of OpenAI and Imogen of Google? Let's break it down step by step. The Monte Carlo method works by harnessing randomness to solve problems that are too complex for exact solutions. Imagine you want to calculate the area of an irregular shape. Instead of using traditional geometry, you randomly scatter points over a square that encloses the shape. The ratio of the number of points that fall inside the shape over the total number of points is equal to the ratio of the area of the shape over the area of the square, which we can easily compute. A simple multiplication of the two sides by the area of the square would give the area of the irregular shape that we were after. Now let's use this method to find an estimate for the value of pi. For that, we replace the irregular shape with a circle of radius 1 cm enclosed by a square whose sides are each 2 cm. We know that the area of the circle is equal to pi. Throwing random points inside the square and counting the ratio of points inside the circle over the total number of points will be equal to pi divided by the area of the square, which is 4. So, here is our estimate for the value of pi. The brilliance of the Monte Carlo method is that this same principle works even for problems far more intricate, like predicting weather systems, optimizing supply chains, or modeling quantum particles. The Monte Carlo method uses random sampling to approximate solutions to problems that are too complex to solve directly. Instead of trying to calculate an exact solution which might be impossible or computationally expensive, we rely on randomness to simulate possible outcomes. Over time, as we gather more and more random samples, patterns begin to emerge, and these patterns give us an accurate estimate of the solution. But randomness alone isn't enough for some problems with a very high number of variables. The reason is that when the number of variables, which means the dimension of the problem, is very high, 
most of the randomly generated samples fall into non-interesting regions. To imagine the problem, let's remember how we estimated the value of pi. Let's assume for some reason the sides of the square had to be 200 centimeters instead of just 2 centimeters. Then, most of the random points would fall outside of the circle, and we end up with a very poor estimation of pi. That is when the Markov chain Monte Carlo comes in, adding structure to randomness. Markov chains, named after mathematician Andre Markov, are a foundational concept in probability theory and stochastic processes. Andre Markov introduced this concept in the early 20th century with his groundbreaking work on stochastic processes published in 1906. His initial motivation was to extend probability theory to sequences of dependent events, as opposed to the then prevailing focus on independent events. Markov's interest in dependent sequences arose from his work on the distribution of vowels and consonants in literary texts, where he sought to determine whether their occurrence was independent or not. This seemingly niche problem led him to the idea of a chain of events where the probability of each event depends solely on the state of the previous event, rather than the entire sequence of past events. This concept, now known as the Markov property, forms the mathematical backbone of Markov chains. Markov chains are closely related to diffusion processes in physics because both describe systems that evolve over time in a probabilistic manner. In physics, diffusion refers to the process by which particles spread out in space due to random motion, such as the dispersion of molecules in a fluid. This random motion can be modeled as a stochastic process, which is where the connection to Markov chains arises. A Markov chain provides a discrete, stepwise framework for modeling the movement of particles, where each step depends only on the current position and not on the history of the particle's trajectory. This is analogous to the random walk model, a fundamental concept in diffusion theory. In the context of diffusion, the states of a Markov chain represent the possible positions of a particle, and the transition probabilities define the likelihood of the particle moving from one position to another in a given time step. As the number of steps becomes very large and the step size becomes very small, the discrete Markov process transitions into a continuous diffusion process described by the diffusion equation, a partial differential equation that governs the distribution of particle density over time and space. To be fair in giving credits, we need to mention that the diffusion equation, also known as the heat equation in its original context, was first formulated by mathematician and physicist Joseph Fourier in his seminal work, The Analytical Theory of Heat, published in 1822, almost a century before Markov published his work. Fourier developed this equation to describe the distribution of heat in a given region over time, laying the groundwork for the mathematical study of heat conduction. The equation is a partial differential equation where U represents the quantity of interest, for example, concentration. D is the diffusion coefficient, a measure of how quickly the substance spreads, and Nabla squared is the Laplacian operator, representing the spatial distribution of the substance. To see the Markovian nature of this equation, one can discretize the time derivative. As you can see in this version, the quantity of interest at the next time depends on its value at present plus a transition term. Now let me surprise you a bit. This equation is the backbone of most modern AI image generators like DAL-E of OpenAI, Imagine by Google, Midjourney, and Stable Diffusion by Stability AI. We will explore these models and how they use the diffusion model in future videos. If interested, stay tuned. Okay, enough of history. So, how does Markov chain Monte Carlo work? Let's dive in. The key idea that the next state depends only on the current state guarantees that we only explore the regions of interest and our generated samples will not be wasted. To see what I mean, imagine we are going to track an ant. The ant can only move one step at a time, either forward, backward, left, or right. If we were to randomly teleport the ant to any location, it might end up in places it could never actually reach by walking, like the middle of a lake. This teleportation approach would waste a lot of time exploring irrelevant locations. Instead, by only allowing the ant to move one step at a time from its current position, we ensure that it explores the terrain in a connected and meaningful way. This is analogous to how Markov chain Monte Carlo works. 
It generates a sequence of samples where each new sample is drawn from a distribution that depends only on the previous sample. This connectedness ensures that the algorithm efficiently explores the areas of the probability distribution that have a high likelihood, avoiding wasted effort in low probability regions. Let's now see how we can use Markov Chain Monte Carlo to estimate the mean of a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution using data, assuming that the variance, sigma squared, is given. Our goal is to estimate the mean of this distribution based on the following observed data points. Let's first write down our assumptions. We are told that the probability of a single data point, given the parameter mu, is a Gaussian function. Since our data points are independent, we can find the probability of the data set by multiplying the probability of each of the data points. This is known as the likelihood. We also use the Monte Carlo method to generate MU samples from a Gaussian distribution with a mean of 0 and variance of 10. The values here are mostly based on our prior beliefs and chance. We also have the Bayes theorem. So, the probability of MU given the data set can be written as follows. Now let's start with an initial value for mu, let's say 0. The next step is to generate a random mu from the assumed distribution. We call this mu sub nu, so that we know it is the new proposed value for mu. Let's now compute the ratios of probabilities of the new and the current mu given the data set. We substitute the equivalent terms using the Bayes theorem and call it the acceptance ratio. And here is its value. At this point, we need an acceptance criterion for the new mu. That means we need to decide if we want to keep this mu in a container to be averaged over at the end or throw it out. A common choice comes from the metropolis hasting algorithm. In this algorithm, if the probability of new mu is larger than the probability of current mu, we keep the new mu in our container. However, if the probability of new mu is less than the probability of current mu, and only to give low probability regions of the parameter space a chance, we accept it with a probability equal to the acceptance ratio. This can be done by generating a random number between 0 and 1 from a uniform distribution. The new MU will be added to our container only if the generated random number is less than the acceptance ratio. At this point, we just need to repeat the whole process for another, say, 10,000 times. At the end, we take an average of all the accepted MU in the container, and that would be our estimate for MU. Let's now take a moment to review how far we have come. We started with how randomness was first used by physicists to solve problems such as nuclear reactions. Along the way, we observed how the Monte Carlo method can estimate the area of an irregular shape or the ratio of red jelly beans in a large jar. One problem of the pure Monte Carlo method is that it is not scalable. That means for problems with too many variables, for example when our spreadsheet has too many columns, it will be very hard to generate enough random samples in a fairly short amount of time. Hence the method becomes impractical. For this reason, we upgraded to a more advanced version, the Markov Chain Monte Carlo, which still uses random samples, but they must be generated around the previous sample, so that all samples fall in the region of interest. Even Markov Chain Monte Carlo will be inefficient for extremely large dimensions such as those in the current generative AI image generators like DALL-E, Midjourney, and Imagine. These models use another Markov Chain model based on the physics of diffusion, which we plan to cover in future videos. It is interesting to mention that the diffusion models have almost the same goal as we pursued today using the Markov Chain Monte Carlo. They try to find an estimate for the probability distribution of a dataset. They are just more effective than Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So to learn the concepts of those state-of-the-art models, one needs to first understand the concepts that we discussed today. And here is a fundamental question for you to think about. Why do we always need to find the probability distribution of our dataset in almost all machine learning problems? 
How can we use Markov Chain Monte Carlo to build a game engine that can play a board game? If you are interested in hands-on learning how to implement the code for the examples we have covered today and how to develop a board game engine using Monte Carlo methods, join the Compufiler community to get notified of the real-time workshop series we plan to hold soon. We'll send the event details via email, so register using the link in the description below. I hope you have enjoyed this video, take care and I'll see you in the next video.